because he wants to uh, have more time for talking. And um, just I would say, uh, he doesn't really need my introduction. You can Google and find out about Jeff. He's a graduate of MIT, and uh, he has always, uh, in fact, the entire career life, I think he has been in uh, Boston, and um, he has received several awards, several uh, in a novel papers, actually, in Nature. As I said, you can Google and find about his background. Again, I'm uh, quite, uh, I feel it's a quite honor. And, um, I thank you for accepting our invitation coming here. He has been giving two talks yesterday at the Faculty of Medicine, and today at a private session with our students in the afternoon, and a few visits, and now we are looking forward to, to your talk. Please welcome, uh, join me to welcome um, Dr. Frecker. Intestines. Actually, I don't have that number here. But <laughs> actually, the next one, endothelium, like the, all, the, all the blood vessels everywhere, if you add up the, all the endothelial surface area, that's 1,200 squares. That's six tennis courts. That's a lot of area. Okay, and, and this is what, and these are happen to be endothelial cells. So I'll, I'll show you better pictures uh, later. So they line all the surface of all the blood vessels. And then an epithelium line, everything that kind of is like in the long surface. So, the, so the, these are monolayers, and uh, they're, they're big. They're big, and they're big for a reason. It has to do with transport. And uh, it turns out they're plugged into biology everywhere. So for example, uh, morphogenesis, like when you have an embryo, and it has to divide and spread. Uh, the, these are monolayers, layers of single cells. The growth, uh, migration of cells, barrier function, like in the lung, the, the, the epithelium has to be a barrier between the outside, the air, and anything that's in the air, and the body. The same thing with the endothelium, has to be a barrier between the blood and the tissue. Uh, lung injury, for those of you who are interested in lung, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lung guy, so. Um, there's respiratory distress syndrome where there's a problem with barrier function. And ventilator-induced lung injury is a, is a big problem. And people on ventilators, the ventilators can do more damage than, than what the disease does, which can cause disease. Well, leak, you know, when you get inflammation, swelling, pulmonary edema, uh, inflammation, repair, vascular disease, airway disease, ep a lot of you don't know about epithelium as a kind of transition is related to something in growth and cancer. Carcinomas, it turns out uh, carcinomas are 90% of all um, cancers derived from epithelial cells. Uh, and then uh, metastasis, invasion, these are you know, bad things having to do with cancer. And it turns out cancer cells tend to move in chains, ducts, strands, and clusters, not, not individual cells. So uh, 
so all these have to do with how monolayers behave. Monolayers are like this one. So uh, each of these, it turns out, what makes it what I'm particularly interested in, these are these are not individual cellular processes. And there are plenty of people who study individual cellular processes. These are these are collective. It has to do with how the group behaves, not how the individual cell behaves. And the particular thing, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I'm interested in forces and motions, that sort of thing. I don't know very much about chemistry. Uh, but the question is, when when something like this moves or spreads, what are the what are the physical forces that make it move? Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt. But if I don't get to the end. The problem is, there, there are, I'm going to show you, there are physical forces involved when these cells crawl, but the thing is they're invisible. You can, you, can, you can make images of structure, but how do you make images of forces? That's, that's a lot harder to do. So here's a, here's a junction between two cells. There are forces there. The question is, what do they look like? So I'm going to tell you a, a story of five acts. I probably won't get to all five acts, but these are some of the players. Actually, this is an old picture. It's a lot of these. A lot of these from my lab, a letter and what's hanging in, but a couple of key people I want to acknowledge. This is Jim Butler. He's a mathematical physicist, and every nothing in my lab happens without his uh, participation. And he's, he's really uh, something very special. This is Ning Wong, who's one of my trainees. He's now a professor at, at Illinois. He's done very, very well in cell biology. Javi Tripots in Barcelona. Some of the things I'm going to show you are things that he did when he was in my lab. And uh, this is Donna J. Tombe. I'm going to show you some work from him as well. Okay, so this is this is the, the title. It's not the title I gave Zara. I changed it. But I think it was mine. So I called it "Crowding, Hugging, and Jamming: Mob Control and Collective Pressure." So I called it that for a reason. You're going to see. So the first uh, act is a tug of war, trekking the rugged landscape, and, and so on. And I probably won't get to these. So what's the tug of war? Okay, so this is this is a layer of endothelial, excuse me, epithelial cells. They're actually called MDCK cells in the kidney. And I'm going to play a movie. There they go. And this is called a, a wound healing assay. So there's no cells here, as if there's a wound. And here are these cells. They're programmed to to heal the wound. Okay, this is a traditional kind of wound healing assay. And some of you have probably seen. So if the cells are moving, the presumption is that there have to be physical forces involved. These cells, they're crawling across the substrate, maybe they're pulling on each other, and the question is, what are the forces? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. So it turns out motions like these have been recorded for just about 99 years now. This is the first paper I know of, 1914. So this is not news. This is, we've known this for a long time. And uh, we have, we, the presumption has been there have to be forces involved. And the question is, what's, what's the relationship? Right? And if, if any people that runs in mechanics, so the relationship between motions and forces in any system is called mechanics. That's the good of mechanics. So what are these like? So you could pull, uh, are these, uh, is, this, uh, is this a solid-like material? Looks like it's flowing. Maybe maybe it's fluid-like. And my question is, oh, what is it? Well, people have been wondering about these kinds of questions for a long time. So there have been uh, three frameworks that are in the literature, if you read the scientific literature, and the inter interestingly, they're they're contradictory. They all cannot be right. So here's one, and this is actually very uh, current in the last ten years or so, and it has to do with leader cells. The notion is that, that there's specialized cells at the front that are called leader cells that pull the other cells that are behind them. So the, the, the physical picture would be you get in bed, you grab the edge of the blanket, and you, you pull it up under your chin. So the idea is that these leader cells are pulling, and they're, they're dragging the cells behind. Right? So that's a pretty simple idea. If that's true, that means that these cells here are in tension. They have to be in tension. Right? When, you pull, when you pull up the blanket, it's going to be in tension. And so that, that's uh, been thought to be important in wound healing. And, and a lot of the literature, a lot of people are studying these specialized leader cells. Uh, another uh, idea that's in the literature, mostly from engineering, physics, people who model this, 
they say, no, no, it's, it's not about the leader cells. It's actually each of these cells is uh, self-propelled. So the, the model would be like cars in traffic. Each one propels itself. One isn't pulling the other. Or, uh, or soldiers walking in a column, right? They're, each one is self propelled So if that would be the case, then this, the state of stress here would be there's no, there's no intercellular stress. They're all just moving along, pushing themselves. Uh, well, in the cancer field, uh, they, people say, well, no, it's not this and it's not this. It's actually this proliferation of cells back here, cells dividing, proliferating, and they're pushing the front forward. So that's, uh, yeah, the colony expands and, and this front gets pushed forward. So it actually, these cells are in compression. They're, they're pushing the things in front of them. So let's see, you know, these, these three are mutually exclusive. It can't be all three. And so there's no consensus. And even, even the sign, you say, well, what is the stress in here? The, uh, it, it's guesswork. You know? And the reason is because the forces have been inaccessible to measurement. So what we needed to do is make these forces uh, visible. And to do that, we needed some new experimental tools. And that's what some of the guys in my lab did. You know, and by the way, you're only as good as your students and trainees. I did nothing. I did not. They're the ones who actually came up with these things. So here was, uh, here's the same MDCK model there. And it was actually Javi Treacock. He's a guy that came to me from Barcelona. And he was interested in monolayers. I was not interested in monolayers at all. We were interested in smooth muscles because I was interested in asthma. And, and we had developed some ways to image forces in smooth muscle cells. He wanted to figure out how to do it in monolayers like this. It's, it's very technical. It's very mathematical. I'll show, you, I'll show you later how it works. Uh, so he worked with Jim Butler, and they figured out a way to actually image the forces that these cells are exerting on the substrate that they're crawling on. I'll tell you how it works later. So when we finally got this to work, we were shocked at what it looked like. Because we expected there would be some, whatever the dish, whether it's tension, compression, whatever, we thought it would be smooth. And uh, so here's a, a plain, Envelope, uh, excuse me, plain, uh, uh, plain vanilla group of cells. This is this is actually an image of what are called tractions. So these are the traction forces that these cells are exerting on the substrate, and it's color coded. So black is zero. So there are no forces here. The warm colors are cells that are pulling themselves toward the left, and actually the blue are cells that are pulling themselves to the right. And the first surprise is that it's very heterogeneous. You believe about all the cells, they're all moving more or less in the same direction. We thought there would be some smooth distribution of forces, and it's not. It's very heterogeneous with a lot of cells pulling the wrong way. It's a mess. This is kind of the mob control idea I'm starting to work into. And if you actually play the movie, this is the movie, you can see it comes there fluctuate. And so even uh, you, you can't say that any one cell is pulling in, a, in one direction. A, a little while later, it's pulling in a different direction. So it's, this is, physicists call this dynamic heterogeneity. The forces aren't, don't seem to be related to any particular structure, any particular position, any particular cell. It just, it's fluctuating all over the place. Okay? So that's dynamic heterogeneity. So that came as a surprise. You can see there's mostly red at the front edge. So these cells at the front, they are pulling. So they are specialized. They're leader cells. But it's not the whole story. And it turns out we're able to show. I'm not going to go into it, but it's, we show in this paper. The leader cells basically are unimportant in the overall force distribution. It turns out what's happening behind. There are thousands and thousands of cells back here. And they contribute way more than <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's another picture to kind of emphasize the how heterogeneous mm -hmm. the, the, the this and how the fluctuations are so important. Here's a piece of this is bare gel, and you're going to see a, a, a monolayer of MDCK cells sweep from the left to the right, and over here is going to be a graph of the stresses, the tractions at that point as the cells sweep by it. This is my favorite graph ever. <laughs> and so uh, this is, that's, the, that's the background noise. And again, I'll show you how this works. But here come the cells. I mean, it's just all of these fluctuate. It, it, 
it's all about the fluctuations. You know, we had thought that there was going to be some kind of smooth variation with maybe some small fluctuations on top, but it's not. It's huge fluctuations on a small baseline. It turns out it, 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 there's a positive baseline here that shows that there's tension, but the big picture is it's about the fluctuations. So this was this came as news. Turns out to be very important, and it, it leads to the last part of the talk that I'm not going to be able to get to. But maybe I can tell you uh, at the end what that. But what would you expect that if if the cells are moving at different speeds and they're sort of married together? Yes, you, you 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 might. We we didn't anticipate, but it turns out it goes. You're right, but it goes way deeper than that. It, it, I'll, I'll I'll tell you the, okay. the conclusion at the beginning. It won't be clear at the end. Uh, it turns out that the cells are in a state that's called jamming. This is something that is very topical in physics. You ever, you ever go to the supermarket and there's coffee beans, and you open you open it and they don't come out or they get jammed? Mm -hmm. That's jamming. Bang it, shh, out they come. We, we now, we, we have very strong, and, and, and what's characteristic of systems that are jammed or near jammed is that the forces show this, even inner systems that are jammed show this kind of behavior. So it turns out cell jamming is now becoming a, a big thing. We wrote the first paper on it a few years ago, and this is a signature of jamming. There are other signatures having to do with the statistics of this, which we don't want to get into. Everyone's eyes would glaze over, but it's you're you're not wrong, but it's it's way deeper than that. It's more complicated than that. Um, or even I'll give you an example. You've all had the experience. How many people have been to a hockey game? By the way, the Winnipeg Jets beat the Bruins the other day. My Boston Bruins. I was at the game in Boston on Saturday. Um, so when you when the game gets up, everybody goes for the exit, right? And and there's an, and, and it kind of converges, and you're, you're jostling against your neighbor, and you, I, I really want to go that way, but you get swept this way. That's jamming. It's the same kind of phenomenon. Okay. So, uh, so the conclusions are: it's all about the fluctuations. Uh, the action is far. You know, here's the leader cell, but there's plenty of action behind the leader cell. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I didn't. And look at this. This one is just kind of what I alluded to this. These, this group of cells here is the same as this bunch. It's more than one cell. They're moving to the left, but their feet are pulling to the right. So it's like they're trying to go back where they were, but they're being swept along by the crowd. So what's that about? Uh, so it turns out in people who study cell migration, which are people in development and cancer, and so how does one cell get to another place? These are the mechanisms that we know about. Uh, chemotaxis means cells follow some kind of a chemical gradient. They follow their nose. Durotaxis means they can actually feel what they're crawling on, and they want to typically go to the, the stiff, the soft here and the stiff there. They want to go to the stiffer region. And haptotaxis means uh, they have differences of adhesion. They're more adhesive this way than that way, so they tend to go uh, uh, adhesion gradient. Well, this is. This phenomenon is none of those. It's, it's something else. Somehow the cells, even though they're pulling to the right, they go to the left. So there's some other phenomenon going on. So I haven't shown you the whole picture. This is only a part. This is, the, this is the forces the cells exert on the substrate. What about the forces they exert on each other? Like again, when you're in the hockey game, you're elbowing the people next to you. This is just the forces of your feet on the ground. So this is where Donald J. Tombe, uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow, came to me about three years ago. So the physical picture is something like this. Here are the cells, and these forces here correspond to these arrows of the stresses that the cells exert on the substrate. But then they're, they're pulling on each other. So you get this kind of picture of a tug of war. And once you have this picture of a tug of war, it becomes really easy to understand because Anyone here, if I, if I said this is one unit of force, another, another, and I asked, what's the distribution of tension in the row? Well, it's simple. The forces have to add up. So it's zero here, one, two, three. So the tension here is three. Okay. You, don't, you don't have to be uh, Einstein to figure this out. Um, it, it, it's a little more complicated than that. So uh, let me talk about uh, a little bit about the history 
of how we, before I show you what those forces look like, the history of this. And how it works. This whole field was, uh, uh, came from a guy named Cyril Harris uh, in 1980. And what he did is he put cells on thin silicon sheets and he, was, and he showed that the cells actually could make the sheet wrinkle. And so that, this was a big deal. It showed cells generate force. Almost, yeah. The question, is that tension measurement, is that in one direction or is it in both directions? Uh, I'm gonna show you, it's, we get the complete, temp it, the one I showed you is a vector. I only showed one direction, just for imaging purposes, you can get both directions. And the stresses in the cells are actually a tensor, and we can, we can resolve the complete tensor. I'll, 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 I know a lot of you don't know what tensors are, but I'll, I'll explain when we get there. But we get the complete state of stress everywhere. I'll show you that. So this was the first, uh, the first uh, study, and it showed the existence of these forces, self energy forces, and, and it was qualitative, totally qualitative. You, know, you look at the wrinkles in there, and there must have been a force. It turns out a guy named Mike Dembo, a really smart guy at Boston University, he showed that you, using something more complicated than this, you can actually visualize the forces and, show you this and quantify them. But it turns out the mathematics of doing this were horrendous supercomputers and so on. Uh, it was then Jim Butler in my group who showed you can do the same thing as Dembo, but way, way, way simpler and way, way faster. And he made the code available to everyone. So now everyone uses uh, Jim Butler's code. So it simplified the whole process. Instead of using a supercomputer, you can use a desktop computer. And it democratized the process. So we gave the software away to everybody. And here you can get, actually, this is a physical map of the forces that a cell is exerting on the substrate. Here, here, and it's, it's pulling towards the center. And then uh, Rama Krishnan in, in my lab showed how you can uh, uh, you can stretch cells and measure these forces. And but then with, with this talk is what is actually the collective behavior. That was much harder. It was Javi Tripod who, who came up with this how to do this for monolayers and actually a tug of war. That's the picture I showed you. And then Donna J. Tambe, this is what I'm, I'm going to start to tell you about figured out how to get the forces between the cells. And there's several other things. So, so this is how the technique actually works. Uh, we have a, a, a gel. Typically, it's, poly, it's uh, polyacrylamide, or you can use PDMS. And it has fluorescent beads. These little green dots uh, represent fluorescent beads that we put just under the surface. So they're half micron. We use a different kind of fluorescent bead that down about two millimeters, two, excuse me, two microns down. These use the correction of stage drift. But what happens is when the cell, here's a, this is a monolayer cell, so when the cell pulls on this gel, it deforms the gel, and we, we measure how much these, these fluorescent beads move. And so we can get a measure of the deformation of the gel. And then from, if, you know how, if you know how the gel behaves, if we know how the gel behaves, and you know a little mathematics, you can say, well, what were the distribution of tractions, these tractions, that caused that distribution of deformation? It's called an inverse problem. So you can solve that. So that's what Javi Tripod and Jim Butler did. By measuring how these beads get deformed, when you pull on them, you can figure out this traction and its distribution. And it turns out it's almost as simple, and I told you already, if you know the traction forces, these red arrows, which you get from the beads, you can just add up the forces to get the intercellular stresses. So that's how it works. Okay, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. So you um, just take a, a movie of the play? You just make a movie. Make a movie and put it in the just make a movie and you can actually, what you need, you need the initial position of the, of the, the unstressed position of the cells. You can do that ahead, or then you can trip some ice, take the cells off, get that, and then it's, this is, now, it's, this is easy to do. Yeah. This is easy, we do it every day, New people come in the lab, in a week or two they learn how to do it. It's, this is the math behind it. Yeah. We took some doing, but that's done. I mean, look it up. <laughs> and it's just the, you know, the algorithm sort of things. So, so those are the, the, the this answers uh, about your question. We actually get, the, this is a vector, TI, so it's in the plane, we get the vector. And from that, it turns out this is a differential equation. Solve that, and you can get everything you want to know. And it turns out this is really important. It turns out to be virtually independent.
make of any assumption. You don't have to assume anything. This is not a model. This is not a theory. This is a measurement. And all you have to assume is that the, the gel is elastic and you know the elastic property. It is, and we do. Uh, I say almost model free. There are some subtleties. Uh, the subtleties are described in this paper that just appeared for those of you who are interested. But for practical purposes, it's, it's, it's this. So, uh, oh, Act Two. I'm, I'm supposed to finish when? Sorry. Okay. So, trucking the, the, the rugged landscape. This was an important discovery. It's something we call lithopaxis. Okay. So, here's a, this is now an endothelial monolayer. And uh, we, we were interested in that about, you know, okay, we can measure the traction forces. What about the intercellular forces, the, the, the cells that one? the forces that one cell exerts on its neighbors. Uh, so actually, here's a map doing the process I told you about. This turns out to be a map of the intracellular stresses here. This is like, these are actually the tensile stresses. So if you can, it, it's kind of shown here in perspective. That, that corner is that corner, this corner is this corner, that corner. Can you, everyone gets that? And it's really striking because when you look at the tension in this model there, it's very heterogeneous. It's not like the plains of, uh, of the tundra. It's not like Vermont, even with rolling hills. It's like the Himalayan mountains. You get these huge peaks of tension, and then not very far away, a little bit of compression, and then another huge mountain range of tension. It's, again, tremendously heterogeneous. But, but the landscape changes. It, it, it's, it's changing all the time. The mountain can move. It, it can move. moves, it disappears, a new mountain range appears. And uh, but this is very typical of what we see. Very typical. Uh, and and this this mountain range is it's created by a pack of about 30 cells that are once pulling on the next, pulling on the next, to, to cause this buildup of tension. So we call it a uh, I, I don't know if I wrote it here. It's like a tension pileup. This, this tug of war, and you get this huge pileup of, uh, of stresses. It's cells acting cooperatively. Bunch of cells all decide to pull in the same direction at the same time. Okay. Um, is it also true to say that it's related to the orientation of the cells? It is. It is. We've actually shown that in endothelial cells uh, have a preferred orientation. I'm going to get to that. Preferred orientation, and it is. Epithelial cells don't show a preferred orientation, but you see the same thing. So, yes, you're right. But it turns out. You often get alignment of cells, but even when you don't, you still see the same thing. Now here's now, okay. Now this, this looks really complicated, and it, it is, but it's you, it's very understandable. So this is showing the tension. So a tension is a number like pressure, the opposite effect, the negative of pressure, and it's just the average value that doesn't take into account direction. So would you be surprised if I told you if I looked at the state of stress here? that if the tension might be, or the force might be bigger in one direction than another. Now, you probably wouldn't be surprised because it's, it, we, we call that anisotropic stress. So what we did is at every point, let's say here, here, and here, we can represent the state of stress by an ellipse. So, so the ellipse represents the stress. And what it's saying is that cell right there is pulling more this way than it's pulling that way. And actually, the, the that major axis of ellipse is a measure of the stress. So it's very anisotropic. Uh, what you can also see is there's a preferred direction. So that one here is it, it's called principal orientation. So those of you who study mechanics, so that's the principal orientation. And you can see that it's cooperative. There are kind of these big swirls of stress that are kind of cooperative over 10 to 50 seconds. Depending. And again, here, there's these big cooperative regions where the cells are kind of showing like as if they're flowing and trying to try. You can see that they're, they're, in this case, they're aligned with the cell orientation, the cell body. Now, what I didn't tell you yet is what the red arrows are. It turns out the red arrows are the migration velocities. We measure by particle image velocimetry. So, and, what, and what your eye tells you, if you look down here, you can see it very clearly. Your eye tells you that the cells seem to be moving along the direction of principal orientation. 
They're following the alignment of the ellipses. So I, I really I don't know why that is, but it's what we observe. It's it's very systematic. It's not ironclad, but I'll show you the statistics in a second again here. These cells are swirling this way, and they tend to follow the direction of the stress orientation. So this is the first connection between stresses and motion. It's not a complete equation of motion, but it's, it's an important relationship. Now here's a really interesting thing that we don't understand and we think is very, very important. For any of you who studied engineering mechanics, you know that these principal orientations are special for another reason, because it turns out those orientations are orientations in which the shear stress is zero. So if you look at, here's a cell, I'll find a cell. That's a normal stress, normal meaning perpendicular. So this is like this cell tugging on the one next to it. The blue arrow is the shear stress, like this, rubbing against it. So that's the shear stress. And what this picture is saying is, cells move along the direction of maximum principal orientation, which happens to be the direction of zero shear stress. We, we know that, it's, it's for sure. So it's saying that somehow cells, they're happy to pull on one another, but they're not happy to have shear stress. So it's somehow the adhesion molecules here that are sticking these cells together, they can't support shear stress. This is, that's a new finding. No one's even thought about shear stresses, but you couldn't measure them. But now we can measure them, we can image them. I, I, I've been showing you the image, but the shear stress is actually the ratio of the maximum the difference between the max and min. And what this says is that cells tend to move along directions of zero shear stress. So this is, it might sound esoteric, but it's really important in terms of how cells move. So along principal orientations, by definition, shear stress is zero. And that says cells track along shear-free trajectories. I think this may be a really important principle of biology. So it's not chemotaxis, it's not aptotaxis, it's not durotaxis. It's something else that's innately collective. It's not about one cell. This doesn't happen for one cell by itself. So we gave it a name. It's good to give things a name. So we called it plithotaxis. That's the Greek. And plith is uh, uh, the Greek word for crowd, swarm, or throng. And taxis means arrangement. So, and, and the principle is that neighboring cells join forces to transmit normal stresses, the red arrows, across cell-cell junctions, but they migrate along orientations minimum intracellular shear stress. So this was Don J. Tambay's uh, discovery, and uh, it's getting some attention. So that's uh, a good. Uh, would you explain a simple thing? How do the cells actually apply a force to the, to the layer of the, is it legs? Or oh, 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 the substrate? Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't say. So there's, there's a he adhesion molecules, especially integrants. So integrants are transmembrane molecules, they, they hook, and I also didn't tell you, these are collagen-coated gels, so the integrins love to bind to collagen in their extracellular vein, and they bind to focal adhesions and stress bodies, cables inside the cell. I probably should have shown you that, so thank you for helping me put that in. So, uh, so it's those adhesion molecules, integrins are how cells, even single cells, crawl along. They pull themselves along. So, so they, they look like a like, suction cup. And then like, kind of like I said, it's, it, it bonds like crazy glue on It binds, and then it, and then you and have. You let it go and to move. And, and then it's got it's got motor proteins <coughs> on the side that pull the cell along that cable, and then and then in the rear of the cell it pulls up those adhesions and keeps moving forward. So that's how it does. Yeah, this is a very highly studied area, and this is pretty well known. And it's also known that in terms of here, in terms of cell-cell contacts, there are three different kinds of adhesion. There are in inherent junctions, which are catechins, which are homodimers that look to each other. There's desmosomes, there are type junctions. So there's all kinds of molecules here. But apparently they can't support shear stress. They're happy to pull, but if you go this way, they, they either break or slide or something. They, they can't exert any force. But then, <coughs> the, the, you know, for them to go to the same orientation mm -hmm. and avoid shear stress and something, there must be some control of this. Yeah. The, the, the molecules. There must be. There must be. And, and now we have the tools to start to look at it. We can make, before it was just in the dark. Mm -hmm. So now the, the lights are on. So, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, I, this is not something I could do. 
that you have to know about the, the signaling pathways and so on, which is not my thing, but in terms of the forces, um, uh, you can do that. So here's kind of like peeling the layers, seeing the, 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 the uh, base contrast image and then all the stresses. And the same thing there. Uh, let me, in the interest of time, I'm going to actually skip over this. this, what this these are the statistics that back up everything I told you, um, and I'm going to skip it, except to say this. We actually tested it on a certain lines of cancer cells with certain interventions. I'm not going to go through these details. Let me just skip forward to just the result. Here's the result. Um, these are uh, breast cancer cell lines here, and, and this is the control. This is an oncogene that causes a proliferation, so you can see there's more cells here. And importantly, this is another oncogene, 14 through 3 zeta, that breaks down cell-cell junctions. And uh, what you find is that in this case, this is showing how cells move relative to the principal orientation I told you about. So cells get steered by their neighbors, and they're just like it's a hockey game. You wind up getting channeled by your neighbors even if you don't want to go that way. So there's some kind of a control here or, or steering, but when you disrupt cell-cell junction, you can go in any direction. The principal orientation is this way, but you can go that way. So this is, we think that here, plinthotaxis is strong, so there's strong cell-cell guidance, but here, in, when you get a, a metastatic kind of disease, you, you lose cell-cell guidance, and cells can just go scattering off all over the time. So let me skip that. Okay. Um, so, okay, I, okay, I'm just going to do this next part and then we'll stop. So what I've told you some, so far is that there's this plinthotaxis idea, and it's, it's kind of intuitive. It says that cells migrate in the direction that they are pulling themselves. Okay. Well, that's, that makes sense. And, and also in the same direction that they're being pulled by their neighbors. So on that, that's what we find in, that's what and it's the, you know, the tug of war idea, plus you know, the idea that you get steered by, the, there's no direction with the neighbors. They, you get highly steered by your neighbors. And there's this corollary that I mentioned that it means cells migrate in direction of minimum intercellular shear stress, which is something I think will keep a lot of people busy for a while. But now there's, uh, and, and then th those are those stresses. Now I'm gonna jump into it on something, we, this is now, uh, brand new, it's not published yet. Uh, and actually, this is the first time these data are being presented, so it, it, hopefully this won't be rough. Get the idea across. It's really game case. It's something new called the keynote axis, and this is totally counterintuitive. We never, we, we were shocked, and we weren't even trying to find, we were trying to do something else, and we stumbled into this. That's the way it is. So when things don't work out the way you thought, that's when you really discover something interesting. This is one. And it says the cells systematically migrate 90 degrees or even 180 degrees in the direction they're pulling. So there's a, I'm going to pull this way. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to show you how this works. So this has what I call it edge states and chemotaxis. So here's, again, here's our friend, the MDCK cells. So here we did something very clever. We were uh, impressed by everything being heterogeneous and fluctuating. And I had said to fellow, uh, uh, Jay Kim, uh, a bright Korean guy, but his background in engineering, didn't know any biology. Uh, I said, we want to get the equation of motion. Like, for those of you in mechanics, Navier's equation, Navier-Stokes equation, what's the relationship between force and velocity? And it's going to be really hard with all these fluctuations going on. So instead, uh, why don't we put an obstacle? So this is an obstacle. Let's put an obstacle in the way of the cells so that we get systematic gradients. And then we're going to even make bunch, a bunches of these and we'll average over them. So we average out the fluctuations. So we'll get the smooth motion of the cells, we'll get the stresses, and we'll discover the relationship between the motions and the stresses. The equation of the motion. That was, that was what we wanted to do. It isn't what we did. So, uh, so this is, these are MDC cases. I'm going to play the movie in a second. They're coated on, this is collagen, collagen coated gel, but here we <coughs> made a mask where there's no collagen here, so the cells can't stick. But the cells can't go, they might want to go here, but 
but they can't go here. So we call this a frustrated edge. The cells kind of want to go there, but we don't let it go there. So let me play the movie. Let's see here. Play the movie, and we'll see what happens. Okay, there go the cells. No, they, they don't. Although they send, a, it's a it's a whole different story. So there's there's stress waves that bounce back. I'm not going to tell you what it's. You can you can publish that. I'll tell you. What. So in in your mind's eye, in fact, we what we were thinking is you can imagine the cells. You see them moving. You imagine that they're pulling themselves along in the direction of motion. So that's a plausible idea. It fits our intuition. It's even consistent with plutopaxis. And it turns out it's totally wrong. Okay. So let me let me show you what I think it's wrong. So now back up. Here's the here's the monolayer of MDCK cells. It's, here's our reason that they can't stick to bare gel. And this is a little while later. It, they've enveloped part of that this barrier and now they've totally surrounded it after 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So let's now look, let's look a little closer. It, these are the velocity vectors, the migration velocity. So here you can see there's lots of fluctuations. They hit the barrier. That's that's what engineers call a stagnation point. That's where actually the cell velocity is zero. There's no motion normal to the surface or parallel. So this, the stream divides this way and this way. Here's this region over the top. And now here, here, that's a downstream stagnation point. The cells have come around, stop, and, and then turn. So you get an upstream and a downstream stagnation point. So this is for one realization. And uh, then if you average over a bunch of these things, we averaged over six. It turns out we should have done more, but we did six. It smooths out the fluctuations. So you see this, all the cells heading on average from left to right. Here they are. Here's the stagnation point at the equator. Here's the downstream stagnation point. So you get nice velocity profile. So any of you who've studied fluid mechanics, we flow over a cylinder. Same, same kind of problem. Here are the traction forces. These are the forces exerted by the cells on the, on the, the gel algorithm. So blue represents cells that are pulling themselves to the right. And red are the ones pulling, see a few here, pulling the other way. But again, this is an average. So on average, it's, it's very much monolayer is pulling itself to the right. It collides with the barrier here. I'll come back to this one. But here, look at this. So this is now, a, in the downstream part, where the, after the cells converge in it, it's not blue anymore, it's red. So these cells are actually moving this way, and that way I'll show you, but they're actually pulling to the left. And actually these over the top, this is the, 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 the traction in this direction, they're, oh, excuse me, this one is, they're pulling down. So this, this is really strange. So the, the cells always pull towards the empty space. Let me go into a little more detail. This is actually the color code here represents tension in the in the monolayer. So the tension starts at zero and it builds up going away. And now we can, I mean, this is a blow up of this region. So far away, before you hit the barrier, the stress orientations at which are the ellipse, the velocities, which are the blue arrow, and the traction forces, which are the black arrow, are all aligned. That's like flipping caps. But here, something else is happening. In fact, let me let me blow these up. Look what happens here. When you get to these, the cells are pulling this way. The principal orientation is that way, and the velocity is this way. They they're systematically misaligned. This is very strange. And look over here. If you look up over the top, take let's say this one. The cell is pulling this way. The principal stress orientation is that way, but it's moving that way. And here the cells, right near the surface, they're pulling towards the empty space. And here, even, even though the cells are moving away, they're pulling back. 
So this this seems crazy, but it's actually not so crazy. If anyone here sail? Any, any sailors? Okay, so w look at this picture. Which the way is big? Hmm? The is big? Well, there's a lake. Which way is the wind coming from? West. In this picture. In this <laughs> relative. <laughs> so you're the sailor. Can you tell which way the wind's coming from? Hmm? Right. Yeah. No, it actually it's coming right. It's coming right. Like a, boy, this is close, it's close, close haul. Right? This is a feeding to windward. So it's, it's counterintuitive, but it, it works. You can take a sailboat, and the wind is going this way. You can sail into the wind. It's called feeding to windward. You can come, come to about 45 degrees. So how can it be that the wind is blowing this way and you can sail into the wind? No, you can't. It turns out if you think enough about it, you can, well, A, you can watch it happen, and, and you can actually figure out the physics. Well, this is the same kind of thing. We don't understand it, but somehow cells, let's say cells here, they're pulling to the left, but they're moving to the right. 180 degrees different. Well, let me skip that. And so it, again, here, this is, these cells are all oriented pull towards this empty space. So we call this kinotaxi. We don't understand it. Kino is the Greek word for vacuum. So this is a vacuum arrangement. It says that local tractions polarize towards unfilled space, or what we call the frustrated edge, regardless of how they're moving. So the cells just, when they see unfilled space, they want to go there, but they can't, because they, they can't stick, they can't walk on that. So somehow, kinotaxis trumps plithotaxis. The cells, somehow they can pull one way and set their intercellular stresses another way and go third way. Kind of like a boat sailing upwind. And we don't understand it, but the data are very, very solid. But it tells you that the control system and whatever the motion mechanism there is quite stupid. Because, I mean, it is a, a barrier that you can't cross, but you just keep. Well, if, if we, y yes, although it's saying that these, usually, these monolayer cells, they're programmed to fill empty space. Heal a wound, fill well, a gap. You, stop, well, you, you think they should stop, but if there's, uh, they don't. So this is how they behave. So we need someone smart here to figure out how this works. Actually, I'm going to. Uh, uh, let me go on. Let's see. So, so there's uh, one more thing about this, and then I'm going to stop. I think of a just amount of time. This would be a good place to stop. So I noticed here. I said this is crazy. Okay, the cells are pulling to the left, but they're moving to the right. But then if you go way downstream, everything realigns. Now they're pulling and moving in the same direction. But th this system is totally symmetric. So somehow the traction forces have to flip, and they could flip counterclockwise or, or clockwise or counterclockwise. They could go either way. But there's no way to tell. If you go like a coin balanced on its edge, it could go one way or the other. That's a sign of instability point in its edge is unstable. So I said, th this has got to be an unstable flow, like a turbulent flow in fluid mechanics. So I said to our guys, you know, there's got to be something weird happening here. So we, we started to look closer. And lo and behold, we did a bunch of different imaging. So this is showing tight junction protein. This is just showing cell shape here. This is eccentricity of the cell. This is cell area. This is showing cell boundaries. This is the orientation of the cell. And this is major axis length. And sure enough, right at, right at that point where you get the, uh, the downstream stagnation point, you can see that just something weird is going. It's just the cells are uh, they're somehow flipping their tractions around. And, and, and cells that are, let's say, right there, they're pulling to the left. But their, their neighbors are pulling them to the right. So they get stretched like taffy candy. Right? The intercellular, their, their neighbors are pulling them one way, but their feet are going the other way. So you get these weird shapes, and this is showing, uh, 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 let's see, this is actin, and this is CO1. And uh, it was interesting, I showed this to some of the people in my, uh, in my program who are pathologists, and they said, oh yeah, this look, looks, 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 I think I put it in here. It's, these look just like what's called foreign body epithelial cell granulomas. I don't know that. <laughs> but he said, they, they, you see these whenever you have near sutures or micro implants. So it, it seems like this isn't just an artifact of the culture that captures something that's actually going on in the body. So actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop there.
good place to stop. And I'll take any questions that you have. What's the next step? The next step. Um, we'd, we'd like to understand some of the mechanisms of, of what's going on here. So actually, this 